Then I can go. Then you can start. Yes. So welcome everyone. Good evening from Indonesia. My name is Diana. I'm one of the co-chair of IWHYPN. And um, on behalf of the officers of the YPN, I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar on innovations in adolescent mental health. And this is the first webinar we organized this year. It's an honor to welcome all great speakers today, Dr. Marian Brooks, Michael Jimenez, and also our beloved Manasi Gupta. Thank you for your willingness to share with us today. And I th also thank all the attendees today. I'm going to start with introducing you with the IWH. YPN. The International Association for Adults and Health Young Professionals Network is a community of students, trainees, and early career professionals, including healthcare providers, researchers, public health practitioners, advocates, scientists, social workers, pharmacists, etc. We, uh, in the 10 years of our respective field, who are interested in improving the health of adolescent locally, nationally, and globally. The YPN supports networking, mentorship, and also leadership development, and provides a forum to share training opportunities in adolescent health. The YPN is led by four co-chairs, including me, and also committee officers who have an interface with the IWH Council so that the IWH YPN have a strong voice within the council and vice versa in order to support the development of future leaders in adolescent health. So currently we have 18 officers and our and this is our officers. And we are spread in 11 countries from Canada to Australia. And until now, we have already organized several webinars since 2020. Our webinars aim to span topics of relevance to young professionals. Of course, we hope you can join us live like today, but if not, no worries. All the sessions will be recorded and you can access them in, on the IWH YouTube account. If you're interested in joining us, come and join us in Slack uh, through that um, website. And also, we have what we call Teen Convo. We can share ideas and also you can join our discussion in our Slack channel. And also we will discuss today's topic in our Teen Convo in Slack. So make sure you join us in Slack. If you're interested in joining the IWH Young Professionals Network, come and visit our webpage and become a member today. I'm sure today we are also reaching out to many new friends. Therefore, I would encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat and I'm so happy to have you all here. We all understand the importance of mental health of in adolescents' life. I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place and the right time to accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices. I wish you all a very successful webinar. Thank you. And over to you, Emma and Priya. 
Thank you very much, Diana. Um, so welcome again to our Innovations in Adolescent Mental Health talk today. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday. And um, we have a host of amazing speakers who aim to give us international perspective on this topic. I'll quickly introduce myself. So my name is Emma Rengsami. I'm one of the education and training officers at the YPN. And um, clinically, I'm a GP trainee and academic clinical fellow based in the UK. And I'll let Priya, my co-host, also introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Priya. I am a general pediatrician. I'm also one of the officers with the YPN education and training team. I'm currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at UCSF, and I'm also a co-founder of an NGO called Adolescent Health Champions, which trains young people as peer educators and health leaders in sexual reproductive health and in mental health. Perfect. Okay, so um, as we go along this, please do send your questions as we go along in the chat. And at the end, we'll be um, hoping to answer as many as we can. If we can go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're both from the Education and Training Committee. Our main aim is to really share and create education and training opportunities in adolescent health um, and to truly understand the different needs um, globally. And so we're really, really excited about today's event because it's in honor and end in celebration of World Mental Health Day, which is tomorrow, October 10th. We will be speaking today about global adolescent mental health, some of the challenges and the opportunities we have. And we have such an amazing group of speakers. First, Dr. Marion Brooks, who will be discussing organizing community mental health programs. We also have Michael Jimenez, who will be speaking about digital mental health innovations. And Manasi Gupta, who will be talking about strategies to advocate for adolescent mental health. We will be having a short Q&A at the end. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, we will not be having a time for Q&A in the middle of the speakers because we do want to make sure that each of the speakers has a chance to speak. But at the end, we will be keeping track of all your questions. So go ahead and I'm already seeing so many um, welcomes and introductions coming in and keep the questions coming in throughout. Okay, so I guess we should start this talk by asking ourselves, well, what do we mean by mental health? So according to the World Health Organization's definition, mental health really includes the state of mental well-being, and it spans many different aspects. So we have the ability to cope, deal with stress in our everyday lives, to connect with others in our community and build positive relationships with them, to function and work, and to thrive and build relationships with others. And all in all, mental health is a basic human right, but it's crucial for personal development, community and so socioeconomic development, and it varies from person to person. So whilst this also might mean there might be mental health disorders, it's also about many different things that encompass this wider, wider idea. Next slide, please. And we're focusing on global adolescent mental health, the challenges and opportunities, because we have such a huge population of young people who require a lot of support. Almost a quarter of the world's population is aged 10 to 24 years, with more than two thirds living in low and middle income countries. As we all know, and most of us who are here are very passionate about adolescent health, adolescence is a period of some, so much physical and mental growth as well, and mental health is such a fundamental part of overall health during this time. Unfortunately, as we know, poor mental health can have significant consequences that sometimes starts in adolescence and can impact us throughout our lives and into the next generation as well. Historically, mental health has been something that has been overlooked in the global developmental agenda. And I'm really, really excited that because of many, many people who have put their voices out there, we're starting to see a change as of late. The prevalence of mental health disorders in children and adolescents is almost 15% globally, but we've, we, this is actually mostly data that's coming from Western nations, and there's a lot to suggest that we are still at the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more studies and research and new ideas and innovations that need to come out of our understanding related to mental health, not just in Western nations, but also in many, many other countries. 
We also know that many of the adult mental health problems have their onset before the age of 14 and even before the age of 24, which is a reason why we're having this conversation and why we're having such a focus on adolescent mental health today. There's an intersectional relationship between things like one's gender, race, class, amongst other factors, and one's mental health. And that's something that's very, very important for us to all note. And um, we're hoping that the upcoming conversations that we'll have today will just share a little bit of a glimpse at that as well. So this brings us to where we are now. What challenges do we currently face and what opportunities are there to go forward? And that this can be broken up into five current challenges for global mental health. So firstly, we have the integration of mental health services in primary care and secondary care. Secondly, we are aiming to reduce the cost and improve the supply of important medications for mental neurolog neurological and substance use disorders. And thirdly, we want to train healthcare professionals globally to really provide this evidence-based care with children and adults suffering from mental illness. Fourth, we want to make sure that community-based care and rehabilitation for people with chronic mental illness exists and that it's effective. And finally, we want to strengthen the mental health component in the training for all healthcare professionals to create an equitable workforce and distribution of mental health providers globally. Next slide. So without further ado, we have some amazing speakers who are going to touch on some of these opportunities and challenges, as well as some innovations. Our first speaker is Dr. Marion Brooks. Dr. Brooks is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the lead pediatrician and research director of the Botswana UPenn Partnership. We are so excited to have you, Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks is also a global health physician scientist whose research portfolio includes screening for common mental disorders, integration of mental health services into various medical and non-medical settings, and understanding the contextual factors of introducing evidence-based mental health interventions for globally underserved youth. I was very lucky to meet Dr. Brooks a couple of years ago and also to hear her speak. I'm very, very excited to hear you today. It's going to be a huge treat for our team. Thank you so much. Um, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Great, thank you. Um, so let's try this out here. Can I remotely control the screen? Oh, look at that. It's a little bit of a delay. Okay, pardon my... Um, Newness. Okay, so I'm Marian Brooks. I am going to talk to you about some models. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our own work in Botswana, um, but I kind of just want to get a give a general overview um, for kind of the ways in which um, um, mental health has been innovated for in a variety of different health systems. So what I'm going to talk about is really a brief touch on these different areas and um, our other speakers are going to be able to take a deep dive in some of these areas so we can get a better glimpse of them, but I'm going to talk um, more generally about kind of a, a, a potential model um, for thinking about child and adolescent mental health services um, in a variety of different set of settings. So this is um, a framework based on the WHO's framework from 2008, um, but that we uh, also present um, in a paper I wrote with Dr. Priti Galagali. And um, basically, it's essentially thinking about all the levels in which people are going to be interacting with um, the mental health or young people, children and adolescents are going to be interacting with uh, mental health. And this is, uh, you know, a very medicine centric model and just I'm just going to note um, along the way areas in which medicine is sort of not the only way um, that we need to be thinking about mental health, but I'll focus mostly on the medical component. So when you think about, you know, sort of the base of the pyramid, so we don't think about it at the bottom, we think about it as the, the big supporting section is, um, is uh, lay counselors. So using um, peer educators, lay counselors, and I think they, they can often be used differently. Um, the terms can be used differently. But when I talk about peer 
lay counselors, I'm talking about people who've been trained in lay therapy. So they've been given or they've been trained in an evidence-based therapy model, but they are lay um, health workers. And so in order to, you know, task shift, um, which is often the term or tax, task share, um, the mental health burden, lay um, health workers are often used. And this is considered a, a tool to be used for um, uh, environments where there are not many um, uh, professional health workers. Um, I argue um, that the use of uh, or the, the, the integration of lay health workers is something that we should be thinking about, even if we had all the professionals that we needed, um, because in a way they are, they're providing a, a uh, needed service, but also a, a unique service in, in their layness, right, um, that should be considered a part of every health system. And so in, in task shifting, um, you know, there's, there's some guidelines that are sort of thought about. It's uh, identifying an evidence-based intervention, um, ensuring that the task shifting is appropriate. And for a mental health system, that means really thinking about whether the task shifted um, it, really, I think that, that this task sharing is a better way of thinking about this because uh, lay therapists um, uh, are part of a larger system and a lay therapist should really be uh, have somebody to go to. Um, so there may be that the lay therapist can see many people um, that the professionals just don't have the capacity for. Um, so it, 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 it extends the, the reach of the professionals, but there have to be professionals a part of the, the system. Um, and so when we're thinking about ensuring that task sharing um, or task shifting is appropriate, we have to make sure that there's actually someone to share the task with. Um, and if a system is not equipped to both support the lay therapist and provide them with scaffolding for complex cases, um, then we really need to rethink whether that task shift is appropriate. Then we create an enabling regulatory environment. So this is often overlooked, but we have to make sure that when we're integrating lay health workers, um, that the regulatory environment reflects um, those lay health workers as being a part of the system and not somebody working outside of it. Um, there also should be insurances of quality of care and then some monitoring of an evaluation. And it's really sort of a, 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 an, an additional health system that the lay, the lay therapists um, kind of create. Um, so they may require a lot less training than a professional, but they still require a scaffolding for their system. So the 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 peer model is is one that I you know we work on with um, in my group in Botswana um, and we base our program off of the friendship bench which is a um, a problem solving therapy based lay counselor um, in, um, uh, any enacted um, type of therapy and then our lay counselors work with um, a psychologist and and behavioral health specialists um, uh, as well. So that's a really important um, part of the system, um, particularly when there aren't enough people to see um, all of the patients that have mental health needs as we were already introduced. Then we have mobile and telehealth, which will be touched upon more um, uh, in the next um, talk. So I won't talk about it much, um, but this is an emerging field um, that has a lot of pros and cons. And we've seen how mobile and telehealth have been really used a lot in the um, during COVID. Um, and, and this has actually been used in um, um, countries of various health systems for a really long time. Um, even just telehealth, calling somebody on the phone for a consultation, um, that is, you know, a bare bones telehealth model. Um, and the one thing to think about is sort of like the pros and cons. So just like in task shifting um, with lay, lay health workers, we get a lot of gain from, from lay health workers. And we also have to think about how to support them. In telehealth, we get a lot of gain in, by expanding the reach of, of expertise um, and expanding the reach of the patient. So the patient has the opportunity to, um, to meet with a variety of different health workers, be they lay health workers or professional health workers. Um, through mobile and telehealth technology. The, the cons, of course, is that in some places getting the, the type of, of phone that you need to be able to interact um, in mobile telehealth fashion might be difficult. Um, or 
creating a, a sustained infrastructure for mobile and telehealth. So even if the mobile or telehealth is in the clinic, how do you make sure that the phones are always working, the power is always on and things like that? Um, one of the ways that um, some of the difficulties around mobile and telehealth in the lowest um, resource settings have been overcome is the use of of WhatsApp, but the problem, of course, with WhatsApp is that you have to uh, be con uh, some concerns around privacy and getting into the app and how easy it might be for somebody who who isn't the owner of your phone to see your your chat messages and 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 things like that if they just pick up your phone. Um, so there's some some challenges to be overcome, but I do think that it's something that should be continued to um, explore because um, regardless of of how many cell phones might be in an environment, there are a lot of ways to think about using mobile and telehealth to expand the, expand the reach of, of health um, in a variety of health settings. And then we have, sorry, there we go. Um, so then we have within our uh, pyramid, um, uh, we have, in addition to digital mental, mental, digital mental health services, we have community um, health workers um, and community health settings. So they may be actual community health workers that are um, that are similar to peers, um, or they may be um, to peer, peer support people, or they may be um, community settings where the, uh, it's a community center that has a variety of professionals in it. So it's, it's um, not co-located within a mental health system, but rather or within the clinical health system, but rather in the community to serve another purpose. And one of the things that we do um, with our um, adaptation of the friendship bench in Botswana is we are implementing um, the problem solving therapy delivered by way um, uh, young adult health workers as we do the um, the therapy in a community center, so not in a clinic, not in a hospital. And we found that um, for our youth that are living with HIV, um, they actually do better um, with, with maintaining their visits um, when they're at the community center. Um, and we found the efficacy rate um, in terms of pre-post scores and for common mental disorders this is the same. Um, this is preliminary, um, but it's really exciting to see um, the, the potential for a delivering therapy in a, a community health set setting through a community center um, versus um, a, a, a clinical health system. And we can talk more about that in the question and answers if you have questions. So in addition to um, the community health workers and community systems um, is the teacher model. Um, and so we think about teachers as, you know, if you think about school health systems, so if you're from a, a country that has um, a school health system, we often think about a school health system as sort of a clinic within the school. And there's, there's somebody there to like a medical professional who can do acute and emergency care and chronic disease disease management and talk to the families um, and also coordinate care, sort of th that medical worker can serve as the, the liaison for the, the health team. But when we talk about um, school delivery models or school health models in most places, especially around mental health, we're often talking about teacher delivered models. Um, and the, the most often model, um, the, the model that's most often used um, in a lot of low resource setting is a teacher delivered model. There's a program in Zambia that's actually using a, um, a that did, did a consultory, they, they trained teachers to actually get a like mini diploma in uh, health, psychosocial support. And then they got their diplomas and were able to sort of support the youth um, better. And that's often the model that's used um, in a lot of lower resource settings or, or emerging health systems. Um, so that's nice because um, the teachers are already there. They already, they, they just get topped up skills. They already do a lot of interactions with young people and their families. Um, and that's really helpful. The problem with this model, of course, is that um, that teachers already have a lot of other tasks. Um, and so we really need to be thoughtful about how we're engaging with teachers to do this work. Um, and then 
there's non-professional medical um, professional, non-specialist medical professionals um, who are being used also for these um, health systems, and then um, specialists um, um, who care for adolescents in a variety of different settings, internal medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, and um, adolescent medicine, um, which is sort of in between um, the this group and the specialist group. So in an ideal setting, um, we have this psychiatric most multidisciplinary team um, that is going to be able to take care of our adolescents um, when it comes to mental health. And a lot of systems and innovations are, are pushing towards a model that includes, you know, a psychiatrist and, and well-trained psychologist and specializes in both of those will specialize in child and adolescent. Then we have social workers and, um, and nurses that are psychiatric trained, um, ancillary staff like creative arts therapists and diversional play therapists and things like that. So this is sort of the most resource intensive model, but I argue that um, we should really be thinking um, in, in a lot of our, uh, our research and our thinking is um, centered on psychiatrists, mental health specialists, um, medical professionals like us. Um, uh, but I, I think we need to be thinking about models in the way that um, Ram Swamy and his team um, uh, and their team put together in this really nice paper in the Lancet Regional Health um, for Southeast Asia recently, which is that the mental health is within a larger system. Um, so we have, um, you know, mental health specialists and physicians and nurses and provider and, and pharmacy providers and things like that. But we also want all of the systems that I just talked about to be um, thought about when we're thinking about innovating into the mental health system. So instead of push instead of task shifting until we get to this fancy. Uh, medicine-led system that has all these different type of um, psychiatrists and, and um, therapists and mental, mental health professionals, instead of moving towards that, instead strengthening the system so that it's all within a larger system that really is centered on um, child and adolescent mental health, um, you know, broadly globally. So thinking about child protection, thinking about the law, thinking about the way that education um, can, it can, uh, mental health promotion can be integrated into education and to families and to community members. Um, so I really think that when we think about mental health innovation, um, you know, community mental health is a key part of that. And we should, we should not be thinking about the community mental health as sort of a substitute until, but rather something that is equally uh, important to strengthen. Um, I will stop there um, and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. That was such an amazing presentation and gave a very nice overview and also really augmented the importance of community mental health. So I hope that was really, really informative informative to our participants and who are here today. For the audience, um, we will keep your questions and keep track of them. So we, we do have time for the other speakers, but um, Dr. Brooks, you might see that there are a couple good, great questions here and we will be sure to address them at the, at the end of the presentation. And you're also welcome to type in the chat to some of your answers. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Oops, sorry, I, I, I can't find the, the, uh, the mute, <laughs> unmute so I can mute myself. Um, there we go. <laughs> Thank um, you. Perfect. I think we'll take this opportunity to move to our next speaker. Thank you again, Dr. Brooks. So next we have Mr. Michael Jimenez, who's a registered psychologist and a registered nurse, licensed professional teacher, and holds an MBA degree and also a postgraduate degree in organizational development. He currently consults the Department of Science and Technology in Philippine Science High School IRC curriculum on social and emotional learning and also to help adolescents learn about mental health. He also conducts lectures for educators to help students cope with stress and develop re resilience. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And uh, yes, I am Michael Menes, and uh, I'm from the Philippines. Let me begin by discussing the current statistics on adolescent mental health. 
based on the data that has been uh, presented by UNICEF uh, when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 on poor mental health in children and young people, just the tip of the iceberg. And since we're talking about adolescent mental health, it's very important to take note that one in seven adolescents aged 10 to 19 years old, yes, one in seven adolescents is diagnosed with mental disorder globally. So this is something that is significant in order for us to truly think about what are the necessary interventions that we need to employ in order to address these kinds of problems. In the Philippines alone, among Filipino children aged 5 to 15, 10% to 15% are affected by mental health problems. So this is something that needs to be addressed. But aside from that, it's also very important to note that here in the Philippines, 13 to 15 year old individuals or adolescents, among them 12 in 100 students who are within the age range of 13 to 15 year old have considered attempting suicide. And 16 to 17 year old adolescents 16 in 100 students aged 16 to 17 years old have considered attempting suicide. Hence, we truly have to think of the impact, not just of the stressors among adolescents, but also with this pandemic. And because of this pandemic, there is an increase in the incidence of the cases of anxiety and depression. There are more adolescents right now who experience different kinds of mental health conditions. So let me relate the impact of the pandemic on adolescent mental health. And as I look into that, yes, this pandemic had led to the fear and anxiety among adolescents of contracting the virus. And aside from that, they had also been in a certain situation wherein there is a suspension of physical classes. And because of that, there's a disruption of regular daily routine. And this has led to a decrease of social support from school peers. And we all know that adolescents are individuals who need to be with their peers. If ever there is someone who's very influential among them, it's their peers. Hence, this pandemic has led to poor mental health. Anxiety and depression has risen in the past years. That's why it's very important to look into the school mental health model. That's why here in the Philippines, the Department of Education had come up with a school mental health model in order to address the needs of adolescents in terms of mental health. The Department of Education, together with the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education, Tropical Medicine, and Public Health Network, had partnered in order to come up with a school mental health model, which is made up of what? Modules that explain mental health issues and screening tools in order to identify and give psychosocial support and services for individuals at risk. So let me enumerate the three components of the whole of school approach. In the whole of school approach, it's very important to look at the curriculum and also the school ethos and the environment and family and community partnerships. Well, just to make it simpler, it's made up of the three letter C's. The first letter C is curriculum. The next letter C is culture. And the last letter C, the community. When we talk about the curriculum, we talk about what are the things that need to be done. When we talk about school ethos and environment, what kind of culture must be constructed in the school? And in terms of family and community partnerships, how can parents somehow help our adolescents? And how can family and community partner with schools in order to bring about mental health among adolescents and eventually achieve behavioral, emotional, and social adjustment? The focus here will be on the social emotional learning program. And when we look at the social emotional learning program, we look at the different components of social emotional learning. Is social emotional learning effective in improving the learner? We'll see. Well, in meta-analysis in 2011 of 213 studies involving school-based universal SEL programs, well, there are improvements and there are also reduced risks for failure. There, is a, there are reduced risks for conduct problems, for emotional distress, and increase in social emotional skills. These are early studies, yes, and these are very important. But then let me enumerate the five competencies of the social emotional learning and how we can make use of digital innovations. So the five components of social emotional learning are number one, we have self-awareness. Self-awareness is a very important skill. 
As a matter of fact, according to Daniel Goleman in his book, Emotional Intelligence, if ever there is a prerequisite in order for someone to develop emotional intelligence, it's this one. Literature research has pertained to this as affect labeling. Affect labeling is what? It is putting your feelings into words, putting your emotions into words, being able to recognize this is the emotion that I have right now. For so many years, we have always wanted to evade sadness, escape anger, or perhaps run away from our fears and sadness. However, recent research has given us the data that it's very important to, instead of running away or escaping or evading all of these negative emotions, it's time for us to confront, accept, acknowledge, embrace these emotions. And this is the first component, which is self-awareness. And self-awareness, yes, there are computer applications right now. There are software apps that will help us in order to identify what we feel. Sun Value is one of them. If ever you're going to download this digital application, this digital software, you will see that it tries to track the way that you feel. And that helps a lot in self-awareness. So again, Sun Value, that is a very important tool in order for us to somehow track our emotions. But not only that, there are digital apps available, including Gratitude Self-Help Journal. The Gratitude Self-Help Journal is very important because it tries to help us to talk about our experiences. And as we do that, we will develop self-management. Journaling is a very important thing to do in order to somehow try to reflect, examine, take a pause. It is also a major component of mindfulness because in mindfulness, you have to stop. You have to be in the present moment. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the ability to pay attention in the present moment on purpose, in a particular way, in a non-judgmental manner. That's why if ever there are digital apps which are available, well, a very important app is the application that contains the mindfulness practice exercises of Dr. Diana Winston of the UC Mindfulness uh, Center because all of her mindfulness uh, audio, audio files are there in that app. So in terms of digital innovations, we can use that. Now, the third part in social emotional learning is social awareness. And what is social awareness? Social awareness means that we have to know how to empathize with other people. And that's the reason why it's also very important for us to interact with people on the internet, on social media, with our friends. Social awareness is a very important tool. Sometimes you don't have to be physically there. Just being there in a virtual manner, just giving a message to your friend, sending them the how are you's will already somehow make them feel important that, hey, somebody, someone, somewhere has asked me, how am I right now? These digital innovations are here at our fingertips. We only need to use them. Now, when we experience social awareness, we are also going to develop relationship which is what we call the fourth component of the social emotional learning program. So we can tie up all of these parts of the social emotional learning program together with digital application softwares that yes, are very helpful. In terms of somehow interacting, there are times that you want to interact with people, but people are not available. And that's the reason why because of AI or artificial intelligence, there are software applications right now that somehow help us to process our emotions. Take for instance, Wobot. Wobot or W-O-E-B-O-T, that is an application, a digital innovation that helps us in order to somehow interact with, yes, a computer, a software app. It may not be a person, but it can do the job in a certain manner. I'm not saying that it can replace human beings or psychologists, but yes, it can be very helpful. Why? Because in the process of interacting with a robot or this application that tries to interact with you, you are able to verbalize your emotions. The robot application will ask you, what are you feeling right now? And then you're going to type it. And after typing it, the robot, that chat box is going to, that chat application will answer back. It will restate what you said. It will rephrase what you have verbalized. It will somehow reflect on what you have written or typed there on the inbox. 
So it's very important for us to verbalize things. And all of these applications are easily available. In Google Play, in Apple, we can see these important applications. And yes, the fifth one, the fifth one is responsible decision-making, which is also a very important part in social emotional learning. Now, if all of these applications are going to, yes, responsible decision-making, uh, there are different kinds of apps in the, on the uh, internet. Another thing here in terms of decision-making is how you're going to cope with problems. Yes, and how are you going to develop positive psychology? Sometimes we just focus on what? We focus on the negativity. We focus on depression, anxiety, fear, here in this app called Happy, Happy, Happy Fi, in Happy Fi, we are being told that, hey, yes, of course, you can embrace your negative emotions, but we also must emphasize, we must nurture positive emotions as well, like joy, interest, inspiration, hope, gratitude, pride, serenity, love, awe, amusement. The 10 positive emotions which were related and enumerated and studied by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson and presented in her book, Positivity. So all of these things are very important, the five SELs. And yes, are there digital innovations that somehow help us in order to appreciate these five components of SELs? The answer is yes. The only thing we need to do right now is download, try to experiment, and see what works and which one will work and perhaps share it with other people so that eventually we will help ourselves and help other people as well. And perhaps we can improve the mental health of adolescents worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so Emma. Much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Fantastic talk and really interesting insights into how all these, these areas interlink. Okay, so if we go on to the next slide. So hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Please feel free to pop some questions in the chat. I'm sure Mr. Jimenez will be really happy to answer. Just a few more. Perfect, thank you. Thank again. you, Emma. Thank you. So but last but not least, we have Ms. Manasi Gupta. Manasi is the founder of Hughes of the Mind Mental Wellbeing Foundation and is a mental health advocate. She encourages mental health wellbeing through her workshops, having delivered over 40 text talks worldwide, and she's a published author of the book Hughes of You. She has driven impact for different SDGs in multiple international organizations, and she's currently one of our own YPN officers in the Leadership and Mentorship Committee. So without further ado, Manasi, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you. Manasi, have you been able to get control of the slides? If not, we can do that for you. Manasi, can you hear us? I think you're on mute at the moment. I think we may have actually, we may have lost um, Manasi. So um, we'll go ahead and reach out and make sure she's able to rejoin. Um, in the meantime, I do see that there was a question for, uh, for, for actually for Michael, Dr. Mr. Mr. Jimenez and for Dr. Brooks. Um, so maybe we can go ahead and just, uh, as we're waiting for Manasi, just have, oh, you know what? Actually, as I said that, I think we're, we're back and we will bring those questions at the end. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. And I am sorry for the delay. I just lost my internet connection. So let's go. Um, I'm not able to... Thank you. So... Today, we'll be talking about the different innovations in mental well-being. And we talk, when we talk about innovations, we talk about technology. 
So I'm an engineer by profession, and here I would talk about the different aspects that we can use to advocate mental well-being. Firstly, we will talk about the advancements in technology. What is the need for these, and all? so how are they helping us in advocating mental health secondly we'll also be talking about the consequences of these technologies and the repercussions that they have on how we perceive and connect with our communities so firstly when we talk about the need the question comes why do we even need technology uh, to strategize the advocacy of mental health moving on to the next slide please Thank you. So there are three core components when it comes to technology. First, technology is scalable. We develop a solution for a community in India, and the same can also be applied to different countries along the, uh, across the globe. Of course, keeping the cultural and geographical aspects in mind. This really helps us to collaborate globally and develop solutions that can help people worldwide. Secondly. with the rise in access to internet we need services that help us make things more and more accessible so for example someone is able to access internet even in rural area areas in the country they'll be able to track their mood or also use a lot of simple self help techniques that might not be available otherwise this also helps us track the progress in their mental well being and provide them a holistic support system thirdly when we talk about technology we talk about innovation technology brings about a lot of innovation whether it's in the form of applications community engagement education and so on and so forth and with innovation we can always reach out to our target audience that is adolescents next slide please so firstly we'll talk about the different ai based application I think all across the globe lots of different applications focused on AI and machine learning are being developed. I can speak for my country India a lot of new applications have gained funding and they are built on models that can help predict the mood of people can also replace counselors and therapists by providing robots. Here are some examples of applications that have been doing well in the past and have established themselves in this field. these applications can not only help with the treatment of mental uh, health but can also encourage awareness and advocacy which really helps in shattering the stigma around mental health next slide please when we talk about the stigma related to mental health we cannot deny the importance of education whether it's in schools or colleges and with education comes interactive technology firstly dr michael um, mr michael had really beautifully elaborated the social emotional learning model in his presentation and there are other aspects to how edtech can help us connect with our community firstly edtech platforms or educational technology platforms can help us form game like platforms or interactive platforms which can engage the user and can also enhance engagement secondly they can also be activity based learnings so they're not just learning theoretically but with a lot of practical models which might also resonate with people specializing in expressive arts and diff, um, who can use this platform to express themselves using different media whether it's art movement dance and so on thirdly there's also a component of situational based learning we at use of the mind ourselves are also talking about building a model where we try to educate our community by sharing different situations that they may encounter in their lives and fifth component is data analysis of course by understanding how the audience is interacting with our platform whether it's with the number of clicks the num the amount of time they're spending or how they're just interacting in general we can also enhance these platforms to help them learn things better and educate in a more holistic manner next slide please thirdly when we talk about strategies to advocate mental health we cannot 
miss out on the online communities that are present and the forums as well. So the core aspect of these communities is that they provide a safe sharing space, which is the need of the hour for all the adolescents that we are talking about. Firstly, they are very accessible. And secondly, they're also full of people who are relatable in a way and also provide a sort of comfort. So when we talk about online communities, there are various different forums. One can be professionally moderated discussions, which have counselors and therapists moderating them. Or secondly, we can have online support groups with people joining for different causes or from even across the, the, the globe. Thirdly, we can have different applications and websites where you can interact with counselors themselves. Here are some examples of applications that have done well in the past and have supported a lot of people. Next slide, please. Fourthly, we cannot uh, miss out on the social media platforms that are present. The youth and adolescents of today are very actively present on all social media platforms. And these spaces can also be used to encourage positive psychology and create content that is useful, helpful, and very engaging. So we've put up a screenshot of our community as well. Our organization started as an online community on social media. And there are more and more platforms that are coming up, especially platforms and um, applications such as Discord, which are becoming increasingly popular to engage adolescents. So these platforms are not just used for educational purposes, they can also help us in connecting with different events and creating educational content campaigns. Next slide, please. When we talk about more and more strategies, we have to lay emphasis on the new community engagement strategies that are coming up across the globe. These include podcasts and newsletters. So there are two, three aspects of these community engagement techniques. Number one is that they're very accessible. Whenever you're feeling something, you can just, um, you know, move on to the podcast in your pocket or open up your mail and read the newsletter that you received. So they really make things easier for the person as they are available and very accessible. They're becoming a very popular method to engage communities and advocate mental health. To shatter the stigma around mental health, just beginning conversations is also a very key step. And podcasts and newsletters are something that can be used in every community to do the same. Here are some examples of podcasts that have done really well and are creating change in their communities. Next slide, please. So as you've talked about the various strategies and touched upon the different ways with which we can connect with our community, we also have to look at the other side of things, the challenges that come along with these practices. And we have to be mindful of them so that we can avoid them in the future when we advocate mental health. So let's have a look. Next slide, please. Firstly, when we talk about the increase in the number of applications and online forums, there's always a question of data security and privacy. There are also ethical challenges which arise due to the same. This is something that a lot of organizations are still exploring, including our organization. And we have to see how machine learning and data science pose an ethical challenge to the integration of technology and health because we do not want to pose a risk to the data that we put online. So this is a field that is being explored and this is just food for thought as to you know, how safe are we when we put out our data online. Next slide, please. Secondly, with the rise of social media, there is a rise in content creators, whether it's influencers or coaches as well. This can also lead to a rise in misinformation. Although the intent is good, it can also lead to negative impact at the end of the day. And we have to be very mindful of what we are sharing online if we do not have the right qualifications for the same. So we have to be careful of, for, about the rise in misinformation present online and battle the same. 
with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. And thank you so much. Um, as you can see, as we move to the next slide, you can always reach out to us to engage with the communities um, in your region and advocate mental health. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll share my social media ID as well in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Manasi. That was really, really useful talk and lots of things to think about going forward. Thank you very much. Yes, and I, I hope for all of those who are here today that this has been a really, really enlightening, though sort of lightning speed <laughs> discussion on innovation and adolescent mental health. It's been, especially as a, for, on my perspective, what's been really, really interesting has been seeing so many perspectives. I think we have a physician, a nurse, a psychologist, a social entrepreneur, someone who has started an NGO. So really different perspectives on the issues and also from a sort of, um, systems level perspective to a uh, from a, a little bit to the school level to the technology aspects and some of the also ethical dilemmas that are involved in it so i think i hope this is a lot of food for thought for our audience and i do see that there are several questions um do we have our all of our panelists are you are you still with us yes i think i see uh i see mr jimenez i see uh, yes and I see yes, uh, Brooks. Emma. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, one of the questions um, I'm seeing here is about how to scale these um, AI-based apps in rural contexts where mobile and internet pe penetration is usually very low. Um, has there been any success in doing this in India? And um, maybe Manasi, you might also be able to share a little bit about your own work and your own, um, uh, just a little bit more about your work as well. Sure, thank you so much for this question. And I believe this is a wonderful thing to think about. Firstly, in India, not all the rural areas and villages have access to the internet itself. So it's definitely a challenge to get access to internet and also then to, you know, sort of familiarize everybody with these applications. So uh, a lot of NGOs, uh, including ours, we're working on the grassroots level to educate people about mental well-being by forming support groups and uh, systems in you know an on-ground setting because when the access to internet itself is very challenging these applications cannot be introduced so it's a work in progress it's slowly slowly progressing and i would say even in urban india the applications are coming in very slowly so I think they've been established really well in, um, you know, across the globe, especially the applications that I presented during my presentation. But in India, uh, a lot of applications have just received funding one or two years ago. So it's um, something that we're going on step by step. But I'm really glad that conversations and work towards mental well-being has definitely taken up pace in India, especially after the pandemic. And uh, personally, at our organization, we have a website to connect people with a repository of mental health professionals, but we do not have an application and we have not invested in AI itself ourselves. So we haven't done that yet, but we've had some groundwork. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mansi. That's very, very helpful. It's not, I think that it's, it's, it seems like the technology space is still a work in progress, even in terms of evaluating the impacts of it too, not just the short term, long term, and some of those ethical challenges with it. So yes, if anybody else um, who, who has been a panelist would like to speak on it, please feel free um, as well. Uh, yes, Priya. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I really truly agree with what Manasi had stated. Uh, with all of these AI software applications available in the market, we can really benefit from them. However, the problem is in terms of the internet connection. That's why what uh, the important thing here is to uh, somehow uh, improve the educational system, include it in the curriculum so that those people who are, are in the grassroots level may also learn about simple techniques, make it a part of the curriculum, learning and instruction. Yeah, and I think that's that's my perspective as well. Put it as yes. a, a part of a larger system. Yeah, like all of it needs to fit into a larger 
larger system. And, um, and no one thing is going to be the magic bullet because one of the reasons therapy works is because of the human to human connection. Um, but if there is no human, then having something is that's evidence-based is better than nothing. So it's really thinking about it holistically. So everybody has access, access to the best thing for them. Yes, that, that's true. As Dr. Marion uh, Brooks had also stated during her talk earlier, he said something about the community, the power of the community as a key part in promoting mental health. Yes, yes, that's absolutely true. There's another question I think that um, some of you might, I think actually all of you might have thoughts on. Um, it's from, uh, I believe, Lynn um, Woolley, and apologies if I have uh, not pronounced this correctly. But uh, the question is, we are currently reviewing our peer mentoring program, young adults with a long-term health condition supporting younger people with the same condition. We've been reviewing the latest evidence base, but there seems to be very little out there on the longitudinal, imp longitudinal impact of peer mentoring on the mentee mentor or the breakdown by different backgrounds. Do you have any thoughts on quality points for any peer mentoring program involving young people? So we actually wrote a paper on this. There's a, um, a, a few out there that some that are using um, like feedback from the clients, feedback from the counselors. Um, and then there's like a best practices sort of ideas that came from those of us who have been um, supporting the clients and counselors. Um, so that'll give you a more detailed um, view of it. It's in the Journal of, of Global, Global Medicine, I think it's what it's called. Um, I'll, I'll put, I'll try to find a link. Um, but yeah, so, um, it, there isn't, um, a good longitudinal data, um, um, and, and everybody uses the word peers support or peer counseling or peer therapy differently. So there are, uh, constellations of different ways in which peers are used. Um, and, um, there, there have been some data that look at like teen club, for example, which is a HIV support program for peers to peers, um, that it does help, um, psychosocial, um, outcomes, um, the way that it it looks at adherence is also you know positive. The question is like what other outcomes could we be looking at in terms of self-efficacy and some of the things that uh, Michael Jimenez mentioned as a part of a whole mental well-being package. Um, and that that is something that I think we should be exploring more longitudinally, not just like whether your depression symptoms go down, but rather like are are these um, programs actually promoting positive youth development so that the young people on both sides, both the clients and the counselors come out with a holistic sense of their mental well-being, resilience, mindfulness, all the things that we know support um, uh, uh, ideal well-being as opposed to the absence of mental illness. That, that's really, really well said. And I think one of the, I would also say that, you know, one of the seminal papers was with the friendship bench, which which was for a shorter period of time. It's not with adolescents, but it is. It does have some information about con like long short term. I guess it was six months to one year for scales of depression and anxiety. But I totally agree that we do need to have sort of a more holistic look at this. And also, I think we're going to have to do randomized trials even sometimes to see without the intervention, with the intervention, are, are we seeing any differences between intervention against the control and seeing how things look over time too. So I've been looking for studies myself too. So if anyone sees anything out there, or any, any really, really good studies, uh, keep us posted about those. Um, oh, go ahead. Yes. Mr. Okay. Yes. yes. Um, in, in terms of the effectiveness of peer to peer or one to one uh, peer support, uh, yes, it is effective uh, to a certain extent. However, meta analysis has shown that clinical outcomes are unlikely to improve. So, peer, peer to peer to support. Peer uh, one-on-one -on -one peer support is something which is significant in terms of supporting another person or letting the person talk about his feelings. However, the clinical outcomes in order to be met had to be seen, have to be uh, somehow uh, addressed by a mental health professional. Thank you for those answers. You're welcome. And Hopefully we can actually share some of the papers that we have um, with, with everyone here, all the participants afterwards. That would be really, really helpful. Um, I see another uh, question here. 
Um, let me see. There's one about, are you safe using AI to share their men mental issues? I worry someone could scam them and then take advantage of them. Uh, yes, this may be a safety and a security uh, issue. Although uh, there are studies, uh, data from 36,000, 36,070 robot users were included in a certain analysis. And yes, there is an improvement in terms of, uh, in terms of their uh, emotions or mood. Because remember, if we're talking to another person, about our feelings, that's affect labeling. And when we engage ourselves in affect labeling, our emotions, overwhelming emotions are reduced. So this is also the same thing when we interact with what we call as, an, as a conversational agent. We call this that uh, a bot. So uh, yes, it may also be, uh, it, that's, a, that's a valid issue, the, the security issue. However, again, uh, research has shown that out of the 36,070 users of Wobot, they have seen improvement. So it's something that we need to uh, we need to somehow experience because I also tried to experiment on it and I felt good. I cannot talk to anyone because everybody's busy. So I get my phone and I talk to my Wobot and I feel good. And there are so uh, some interventions which are being offered by Wobot in real time. Sometimes it go, it's going to show you a humorous, a funny video in order for you to somehow have a positive emotion at a certain period of time. Thank you. Manasi and Dr. Brooks, do you have any um, thoughts as well? Because both of you have had experience with some of the ethical dilemmas and challenges when it comes to engaging youth with mental health as well. Sure, I think that's a wonderful question. And also, um, you know, just adding on to what Mr. Michael just shared, I also believe that um, it's very subjective. So, you know, there are lots of applications coming up. So we can't uh, generalize this. There's definitely, you know, um, challenges present. But I think there are applications which are very secure with your data. So I don't know, maybe a one solution to it could also be reading about, um, you know, the security and the legal terms and conditions that we say yes to at the beginning when we download the app, because that can also help us understand where our data goes. Is it being shared with third party vendors, right? Because for every app, the situation is different. And secondly, I think, um, you know, working on or using apps that are definitely recognized and have been reviewed very well would be a safe way to go about things. So uh, it is definitely a challenge, but as shared, you know, it has a lot of uh, positives as well. So it, it's very accessible. You can talk to uh, and someone on the application at 4 a.m. in the night as well. So I think it's just important to be aware, well-read, and also to read about the policies that the app has itself. Thank you for that answer. Just checking the chat for any more questions. Anyone got any final questions at all? And please carry on, please do feel free to carry on the conversation on Twitter using our hashtag and using our Slack as well after this. It'd be great to connect with all of you. I can see a few papers being shared that sound very interesting. Um, Emma, sorry to interrupt. I think we missed a question by Roberto, shared a oh. little earlier. Yeah. Of course. Is that in the main chat? I'll just look for it now. Yes, yes. I found it. So let me just read it out for everybody. Um, Roberto says, adolescents are more open to talk about mental health now, but parents, um, still parents and teachers, especially in rural areas, are reluctant to start these conversations. How can we engage parents and teachers in mental health, or how can we start breaking the biases around mental health? Would anyone like to take So this is something that we actually um, are doing now. Um, we're, we're interviewing parents because there's a big question uh, a lot of the young people think that their parents don't shouldn't want shouldn't know about their like engagement with mental health services because of stigma. Um, and so we're actually interviewing the parents. And the, the problem with the interviews with the parents is that there's a lot of um, uh, bias. Um, they are telling us what they think that we want 
to hear like, of course we support our kids. We want them to have good mental health. Um, so we're really, we're really trying to figure out what's actually happening. Um, Cause it could be that they're being honest that they, they do th- want their kids to have good mental health. And we've actually had no problems getting consent for parents to participate. Um, but the question is um, like, what are their kids seeing? like in terms of how they're putting out their feelings about mental health, like of course, they may want to help their kids, but maybe they're stigmatizing statements that they're making that make their kids feel uncomfortable, or maybe they do have some negative feelings that they're j- just not sharing with us. So we're revamping our interview guys just to get more information as to what actually is going on with the parents, because there are programs, um, um, a variety of programs um, that, uh, that bring in parents into psychoeducation and and other things to um, to engage parents and and adolescent mental health. The problem is is that if we don't know what the 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 point like the the catch point is, then we're creating programs that don't necessarily respond to the actual need. If they have high levels of psychoeducation, but stigma is the problem, then we really need to figure out how to un, un, unlock some of the stigma and show them the ways in which they're being stigma stigmatizing. For example example, um, because some of, sometimes it's not very obvious. We did a healthcare tra- healthcare provider training program for, for stigma and the healthcare providers who had had lots of training and stigma in their training programs didn't realize the ways that they were being stig- stigmatizing. So that tells us that it's, it's probably the same um, for, for parents as well. Um, and that there are a lot of different avenues to explore around really capitalizing off, off of the parent or caregiver child relationship so that we can really serve uh, parents well because they because it can get actually very deep very cultural um, and so I think you know there are people who are doing it and just sort of bringing parents to parent sessions in educational programs that they've they've um, produced um, but you know I, I, there's a lot more to be done there absolutely thank you very much any other <clears throat> yes uh, so thank you very much uh, uh, yes, my honesty, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please go ahead. Uh, okay, so I think there is a knowledge gap, just like what Dr. Brooks had stated. The uh, the knowledge is here, the knowledge of the parents uh, is here, and this is what is required. So awareness is very important. That's why Dr. Brooks said that what we're doing right now, these kinds of seminars are very important in order for people to develop awareness. We also cannot blame the parents. After all, they belong perhaps to generation X. And uh, during those periods, mental health was not really emphasized in schools. So we cannot blame them. We're not saying that they're totally ignorant, but somehow they need to be educated more regarding mental health. So uh, that's a very important point. And um, so we also should somehow tell adolescents that we're having a transition right now. And this transition may be challenging, but it's possible for both generations to have a common knowledge and direction regarding mental health. Definitely, I completely second that. And just to add on to that, I think there are two approaches when you look at it, you know, a bottom up approach or a top down. So when we talk about a top down approach, if, um, until we have policy changes to include mental health in curriculums in schools and colleges, um, it would definitely be very difficult for teachers and parents together to collaborate to talk about mental well being in a very holistic way. Uh, but secondly, from a bottom up approach, you know, collaborating with nonprofits, collaborating with, um, you know, NGOs or uh, even for profit businesses to raise awareness about mental health and just being uh, making parents a part of those discussions to see how it affects their children. That is one thing that can help. Uh, secondly, even if you know school students are participating in them, we can encourage them to have open conversations at home as well. So whenever they feel something, they know how to express it. And that open conversation can make you know environments more comfortable, can maybe create that sharing space at home as well. And thirdly, I think even nonprofits can focus more on uh, talking about mental health 
to different audiences. So even if they're focused on the youth or adolescents, they can also try to have an approach where they intervene everybody in the community. So for example, we had a session very recently, which was in collaboration with the cafe and people of all age groups were present. And we were having a discussion, which definitely had a lot of different perspectives because there were a lot of generation gaps but it created a perspective change and people could empathize with each other. So these bottom-up approaches can also be helpful, um, you know, to create that sort, sort of comfort at um, everybody's um, level in families, in schools, and so on. That's great to hear, Vanessa. Uh, may, may I add to that? Uh, that's very interesting. And uh, th like Dr. Brooks said, he uh, she tried to get uh, ga she tried to get and gather data. And uh, usually in my classes, what I do is that I begin with a mental health stigma scale in order to know where there are the scores in terms of mental health stigma. And then I know who who among them will have a high level of stigma, low level of stigma. And later on, I conduct the seminar. And afterwards, I get the mental health stigma scale again in order to know if there is a decrease in the mental health stigma. So that is uh, the quantitative approach in terms of uh, looking into how, how we will be effectively, uh, how we will effectively address uh, the mental health stigma among adolescents and perhaps parents and perhaps teachers or any individual in different kinds of industries. Thank you both. Thank you. Very interesting discussions. With the interest of time, I think we'll have to slowly draw to a close, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for all your engagement, for all the fantastic conversations I can see in the chat. There is a, um, a query about having the slides for reference. If I'm correct, I believe this will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards, so you can review the slides at that point if, if that um, is okay. And did want to say a very, very, very big thank you to our speakers today. Um, we have from India, from Botswana, and Philadelphia, as well as from Philippines. So thank you so much for many different time zones and, you know, making it here. It's. I also hope there's an opportunity for our panelists to connect with one, one another and do really, really good work in mental health globally. So thank you so much for uh, joining and thank you to the audience for staying till the end and looking forward to many, many conversations um, after this. Very happy World Mental Health Day. Thank you again. Have a great day and hopefully we'll connect with all you. We'll be very soon. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>